Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for this day and the opportunity to be together. As we look at uh, the formation of our faith community and what has brought us to this place, may you keep us ever mindful on you and where you will have us go next. In Christ's name, amen. amen. All right, so church history. If I can get this to work. Um, it's hard to know where to start with church history, right? Because this is, there's a book I have in my office, and it's on the bibliography that you'll have when I print out the printouts. It's called The History of Christianity, the First 3,000 Years, right? Like you think about the math, there's been 2,000 years of church history, of Christian history. But um, this author takes it back because, like, we trace our history through the Jewish people. So this is a really thick book. Linda Snow referenced it during our um, human flourishing class. And I was like, wow. It's a really great book. It's long, hard to read. Um, you read it in EFL. Oh, is that what it is? It's great. I mean, it's kind of, it's the textbook. It's what we had in seminary. And there's some smaller books that, that kind of breeze through stuff. So there's, you think about, you have the ancient church, right? This is like what Jesus left Peter, and they all set that up. And then, um, and we'll go through these in more detail, empire, right? Um, the, the church becomes official. They're no longer killed by the Romans. They, like, overtake the Romans, and the Romans all become Christian. And then um, that whole thing falls apart. The Roman Empire kind of crumbles, and we get the Middle Ages, and there's a lot that goes on in church history there. And then um, conquest, right? Like we try to take everything back by force. And so we have crusades and all of those things. And then the Reformation, which is where a lot of our story starts, right? That's where the Anglican church springs up there. And then we get into motor, not modern. <laughs> get the motor and um, post-motor church. And that's um, kind of a, we'll talk a little bit more about this but kind of a second almost um, empire, right? Like you think about the 1900s. It was kind of a pseudo empire, at least Christianity in America, the way it functioned. And that whole thing fell apart in like the last 30 or 40 years after um, Vietnam kind of, where like institutions kind of fell apart. And that leads us to where we are today. So we'll dive into all of those. Before we start, any questions about church history, things that you've always wondered that you wanna make sure we cover? Yeah. What's the difference between Anglican and Yeah, so <laughs> there's, that's a really tricky question. So Anglican communion. We'll get to that when we get to the Reformation. And also, maybe n next week we're talking about what is the church, like the structure of the church. We'll talk about that more. The Anglican church is, it comes from the Church of England. So the Church of England is our mother church. You think about the age of empire in like the 19th centuries and all that when like England's conquering everything, basically. And um, they send out folks and, and colonize all these places. And so there's Anglican churches that were started by the Church of England, including us, right? All over Africa, all over ev Asia, everywhere, including us. We, we stopped being called the Church of England when we went to war with England, like in the 18th century, right? It was bad for business for us to, to pray for the queen or the king at that time and to call ourselves Church of England. And so we started going by the name Episcopal, the Episcopal Church, which Episcopal is a Greek word that means bishop. So. Well, where's the Anglican church then? I thought it was taking the Anglican story before. No, it's all the same. So we are Anglican, right? We're part of the Anglican communion. Like you think about the Roman Catholic Church, there's the Pope and, and all these things. We have a similar structure. We don't have a Pope, but we have the Archbishop of Canterbury. He is the functional head of the Anglican Communion. He's a bishop in England. Um, and so all these churches are part of the Anglican Communion. This past summer, all the bishops in all the Anglican Communion, including the hundred or so Episcopal bishops in the United States, they all went to England and 800, however many it was, all got together. So that's the Anglican communion. Here we're Episcopal. It gets really tricky in North Texas because um, this will derail the whole thing. We could spend 45 minutes talking about this. About 15 years ago, um, over questions of ordination of women, 
human sexuality, all these things, um, our diocese here split in two. We're still the Episcopal Church. The folks that left call themselves Anglicans. And the Anglican Church is silent, right? They're not like, they don't No, they're not. No, they're not. So oh, they're not. it's a whole, we'll get to that next week. Okay. They, yeah, so if you go to an Anglican church around here, they would call themselves Anglican. They would say they're part of the Anglican communion. Okay. You go tell that to the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he would be surprised by that. Okay. He would not only be surprised, he would be angry. Because yeah. they applied to be a part of the Anglican communion and were denied. Okay. Yeah. Over the fact that all these dioceses, the Anglican communion is based on uh, entities that are connected to that church. Okay. Yeah, so and so they're... That's uh, credibility. We'll get to that. We'll get to that a little bit when we get to um, the Reformation and stuff in here, and then we'll talk about it next week, okay. right? Like we trace our lineage. Right. We have bishops because we're connected to churches who have always had bishops. So Christine's sister is a bishop. She was laid hands on by bishops who were laid hands on by bishops who were laid hands on by bishops who way back when were laid hands on by Peter, okay. who essentially had his laid hands on by Jesus. Right, and so that's called apostolic succession. The way we function as church, that's necessary. And so we need to, which became a real issue when like we went to war with the people who were ordaining our bishops. Right. So we'll get to that in a minute, yeah. Before we get off this subject, I want to clarify yeah. that the Episcopal Church, like the one we belong to, is still accepted by the Anglican community. Not, yeah, I mean, we're, absolutely. yeah, so absolutely. Who split off. Yeah. Correct. Oh. No. So we're par- we're part of the Anglican Communion. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it it's really complicated. They're connect they're connected to Anglican churches in Africa, that are a part of the Anglican Communion. Right. And so. It, yeah, I, it's, yeah, yeah, the Southern Cone and... So Anglicans do believe in, you know, um, female pastors and... Young Episcopals do. You, oh, okay. Right, in the Ang- but even in, in the Anglican Communion, not every um, province does, right? You th- it doesn't have to be the same. Like the, Catholics were like, everybody... Yeah, no, we people. don't have... So Archbishop of Canterbury has no theological control over what it... Like, the Episcopal Church does things, and sometimes we do crazy things. Church in Canada does whatever. The churches in Southern Africa are more conservative. And so they, right, like, we're, we're actually in the minority. And on our views on um, human sexuality and even women's ordination, a little less so women's ordination now, but human sexuality, we're in the minority even within the Anglican Communion. We'll get to the via media, and like we can, faithful Christians can disagree about things. Right. And yeah. And so, yeah. We should do a whole thing about, um, no, it's great. So let's go back to when they used to fight about things again. So, but this is the ancient church, right? Like Peter gets left this thing, and they're like, go build this church. And they try, and they go out, and then the, like the very first thing they do is they come back and they say, there's all these folks who aren't Jewish. Do they need to be circumcised? Right? Which is kind of like, can we ordain women? Can we marry same-sex folks? We're going to figure it out. And so Peter and Paul get in an argument, and like the very first church council that happens really early on is like, do these guys have to get circumcised? Um, and so that happens. Like, and they were getting killed. Like, this is the early time like Stephen, the first martyr, you know, all of these things is happening right after. And then this is where we get the church fathers, right? Like, because there's a lot of work done here because people were running for their lives. Um, It was very, very dangerous to be a Christian. And they're also trying to figure out, like, Jesus didn't leave us a lot of theology. right? Like, basically none of our developed theology is in the Gospels because Jesus, love your neighbor as yourself, and, like, good luck with the rest of it. Right? And so, like the church fathers, they do a bunch of thinking about what is the nature of the Trinity, which Jesus is probably like rolling his eyes. Like, guys, you're really missing the point. 
But these are important things for us to think about. So the church fathers, you've probably heard that term. And then apologetics. Apologetics is making a defense for your faith. Right, this, here they're making a defense because they're all on trial, literally on trial. And so they're making a case. It later became, Bob, can I tell you about why you're a sinner and why you need Jesus? Right, like that's what apologetics became is like telling, you know, the proof of Christianity. And so that, that happened at first. It's kind of interesting. And then the Edict of Milan. And this is when the emperor snapped his fingers, basically, and Christians were no longer killed because it was now official. And so in 313, um, Emperor Constantine, right, he was on a battlefield, and he had this vision of someone carrying something that to him looked like a cross, and he's like, God, if you save my life, I'm going to become Christian. And he did that. And um, Constantine basically made, he was converted, he made Christianity the religion of the state. And so at that point, like everything switched. You were no longer like this incognito band running for your lives. Like now, we have money, we have power, we have authority, we have control, we have all of it. And so um, they go out, and that's where things start to really pick up. Any questions? I have a whole big timeline here in case y'all ask random questions. Any questions about the early church period? Yes. Yeah. So, so Peter was told by Jesus, like, you're going to be the rock mm-hmm. of the church. I know there's first and second Peter, but then a lot of our New Testament, New Testament is Paul. Yep. Are there other Peter writings that get put in this Bible? Probably, yeah. I mean, he was busy out there, like, setting up the structure and, like, leading the people, right? Like, and he did a lot of preaching that people wrote about. It may, frankly, be that he was illiterate. Like, there's the thing, right? Like, Paul talks about, Paul had a scribe, John Mark, right? Um, But you can even see in Paul's letters, he said, look at what big writing I have. That's his way of saying, I'm actually writing this part, which probably meant he had really crappy handwriting, (laughs) which means he would have been the one who was pegged last night in the murder mystery dinner because the handwriting gave it away. But there, right, like, not everyone knew how to read and write, right? And so that may have been a thing, Um, but yeah, so Peter, that's why um, the, the Pope is like the see of Peter, like the throne of Peter, right? Because the Pope for sure traces his lineage all the way back to um, Peter as the first Pope. Yeah, any other? Yeah. Muddled in what way? Like how much Roman Empire did Egypt and how much Christianity did they get? Does that make sense? We got a lot more Roman Empire than they got real Christianity. (laughs) Everything I wear in there, literally everything, is a product of Roman dress. None of it is like Jesus said take this stole or Jesus said take this chasuble. This is like what the royalty wore in the empire. And they're like, oh, we're going to take it because it's pretty. None of it, right? And like... That's a whole nother thing. Seriously, Jesus. Yeah. Well, that now that goes back. Some of that, the the alb, the white thing, that does go back to it was a baptismal dress of even Jewish folks who were being baptized. And so there, it's that it's that idea of it's the very basic thing. But you, then you put on all this other stuff, and it's tools of the trade that was stolen from the empire, right? All of it, like the cathedral system, all of it is like, this is how the church governed. I mean, this is how the empire governed. And so, yeah, we're going to figure out how the church can do it, too. We do it, the Episcopal Church. Like, when we set up the Episcopal Church, I'm spoiling it. We have a bicameral legislature, right? Because we were founded around the time that, you know, the founding fathers had this great idea about separation of power. So we have a house of bishops, we have a house of deputies. Right? And so we're even taking from like the American empire and the way we set up our church. Not every Anglican province has that. Yeah. So how, Go ahead. Like yeah. who was, what church leaders were around? Uh, I guess I used to cover city government because the church felt like yeah. Or was it just Constantine said, this is what I think Christianity is, what role? 
it was pretty dispersed, right? Like it was a bunch of house churches, right? Like James set up a church in Jerusalem. You know, Peter goes here. Paul sets up all these churches, right? Like, you know, Timothy, who we've been preaching about, that's the church in Ephesus, right? Like these letters that we read in church, like those are the churches that there were. There wasn't really an overriding structure. Um, no. Um, one, I'm trying to, there's not big names. Diocletian is one, like he was burned at the stake, essentially. Um, you know, in all of this, like that's a big name from that kind of 300s period. Um, and so there's the thing is a lot of folks were there and they didn't become big Athanasius, right? Like he was around, he was born in the late third century. And so he was around and practicing. He's a name we know because he becomes really important here in the councils, Athanasius. Other people around then, St. John Chrysostom, like all these people that we hear. In the Episcopal Church, we don't spend a lot of time talking about those folks. We, we lose out on some of that. The Orthodox Church is really big into the church fathers and mothers. There were church mothers then too, but um, Justin Martyr was like a second century guy. That's a name people know. Um, How far after like, the heavy church of Euro, heavy church of Eastern Europe? Wasn't that in like the 90s? I think. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at my thing. I didn't know this was going to be a pop quiz. Um, yeah, some of these other names, Ignatius, Polycarp, like John the Apostle died in 100, you know, and so people are extending out then. Um, Is that the same John that is thought to have written the Revelation? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there, the Gospel of John, the letters of John and Revelation, there's some debate over how many Johns there were, but generally John from Revelation is the Apostle John. Tradition says that. And so that's the thing. Like, we say all these things, like Peter or Paul wrote all these letters. Oh, you probably didn't. We talked a couple weeks ago about biblical criticism, where we learned scientifically how to understand things better. But tradition, and tradition is the church fathers and all of that who say they had a pretty good handle. Um, but maybe not. Maybe it was someone from their school of thought. And we talked about that during the Bible stuff. Then. Um, things become official, and then we can organize, and then it becomes, we've got all these places out here, the church James set up, the church that Peter set up, the church that Paul set up. You're all teaching a little bit different things, right? Like, we don't even know if people need to be circumcised, right? We don't know what kind of foods people need. We don't know any of that, and so now we got power and money, and we can travel freely, and so we're going to bring everyone together for councils, right? And so there's, depending on who you talk to, there's like seven ecumenical councils, there's like 11, there's more, like depending on if you're Orthodox or Catholic or, or whatever. Um, so they all get together and then um, decide the things, like things we do every day. The books in the Bible, right, generally comes out of this period because someone said these are the 66 books that are helpful and kind of case closed, right? The Nicene Creed that we say, that happened in a council. All the bishops in the world got together and said, here's what we believe. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, right? It's pretty light on a lot of the stuff we like to argue about. Like basically nothing we want to argue about is in the creed. It doesn't say anything about gender and sexuality. It doesn't say any of you know, that stuff. It's like, do you believe in the Trinity? Do you believe that Jesus died and rose again? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Right? These types of things. That's because the church back then there was diversity in thought, there was diversity in, in belief and practice, but there has to be unity on some core things. Um, so that all happens in here. And so 325 and 381, Nicene, Nicaea and Constantinople. I, the creed that we say that, that we say is the Nicene Creed is actually not the Nicene Creed. The Nicene, <laughs> right? Shocker. Uh, the Nicene Creed was incomplete. 
they had to go back and fix it in 381 at Constantinople. So it's actually the Nicene Constantinopolitan <laughs> Creed, I think. <laughs> I'm just going to say it and own it, right? Because like they, they go and like what group of people ever solve anything the first go around, right? And so they all come back together and they're like, oh, because we do it like the prayer book, right? Like when we get around to, to changing the prayer book again, we're going to spend nine years basically sending them out and saying, you St. Martins, you try these prayers and, and give us feedback and see what questions you still have. It's called trial use. That's not exactly what they were doing, but that's kind of the end result is the creeds went out there and we're going to say these things and all this, but we still have questions. And so we're going to go back and, and fix these things up. Um, and so this is where we become kind of the, the church that we recognize, right? It gets more formalized. It's no longer house churches, right, because they have money and protection by the state, and so they can gather in public. It becomes a business, for lack of a better term. Um, and so people around here, Arius, right, like Arianism is a heresy that maybe you hear about. Um, he's a guy, he kind of questioned the divinity of um, Jesus and whether or not we could... Um, just exactly how good human beings are. Um, and so a lot of the councils were set up because someone became really popular. And we have that now. We have preachers who get followings. And then other folks kind of question what they're talking about. It even happens, you think about you know, celebrity preachers and all that. That's kind of what the councils did. Is, is some guys out there saying this and everyone else is like, well, maybe not so much. We're going to get together and we're going to hash it out. And so that's what's happening during this time. Um, other people, St. Basil, St. Gregory, the other St. Gregory, right? Like all these people, this is where we get names that people recognize more, um, where churches are named after people. Right? There's not a whole lot of churches named after, other than the disciples, the apostles. Um, the, the early church period, there's not like the Episcopal Church of St. Justin or anything like that. But we get into this period, um, and that's when we start naming things after people. Any question about this stuff? Augustine is here. This is when, like, just to give you some context for that. Um, yeah. See, we're moving along, right? Uh, we're figuring all this out. Um, St. Benedict starts to develop. Benedict becomes more important in this period, but he started actually in the period before. And um, because then in right the Middle Ages, fall, yeah. Yeah, this right here. There's only one. There's only one church, there's only really. One church. Yeah. Right, and then everything. Yeah, 1054. Things fall apart. We'll get there in a minute. I just want to make sure that. And it's talking. great. Someone needs to make a movie over 1054. We'll talk about it. <laughs> it's like it's like a western. Um, yeah. So there's generally, because there there's not quite the hard line that'll come in like, in 1100 something. There's. It's called the Second Lateral Council. That's where things get really formalized as Catholic because other people are going too far. Here, they're still okay with some diversity. They're still okay with y'all can do this, you can do this. Kind of like we're trying to do in the Anglican Communion, right? Like we can be generally progressive in the Episcopal Church. Our bishops can still sit and eat lunch with and pray with folks who are more conservative because like we agree on the Nicene Creed stuff and we can have discussion and debate over the other stuff. They're generally here, that, but yeah, the Catholic Church claims all of this. Right. The Orthodox Church also claims all of this. Um, when we skip ahead, 1054, right? Schism, that's when those two things set the ball rolling for everything else. But there's a lot that leads up to that. Because um, here, early Middle Ages, right, like empire's fallen, um, and so people lose protection, people lose money, people lose, all of that. And so monasticism, you know, St. Benedict who started his ministry kind of in the previous period, 
it's when um, the Benedictine rule, which kind of became a shape for monasticism, because these are people, right, like, they're trying to preserve Christianity against, right, like, when everything's falling apart around you. Um, when in the Middle Ages, literally everything was, was falling apart around you, especially in the early Middle Ages, right, like, it was not necessarily an easy time to be alive. Um, and so then tribalism sets in a little bit, right? Like before we were okay with like Bob and his crew over here doing their thing and, and I'll be over here doing my thing as a church. In this period, resources are scarce. Like all these things, right, that, that lead. And then now I'm no longer, like Bob can't do that anymore. So I'm going to say Bob's no longer a Christian. Right. And so this stuff really happens and they start to lay claim for this is how it really works. Um, this is um, so empire starts to shift. Right. Rome fell. Empire starts to shift to, to Constantinople. Right. The empire mo moves east, um, which is Istanbul. Um, and so that becomes another center of power. Right. It had been Rome. Rome still holds on a little bit, but now, and this is like world history stuff, right? The, the balance of power shifts toward the east and, and to Istanbul. Um, this is also a time where Islam is rapidly spreading, like the 8th century. And so no, it's not just me and Bob arguing, right? It's the, the Muslims um, who were at war with, right? The Muslims kind of violently inflict and... I can say that honestly because we turn around and do the exact same thing, right? We're not innocent here. And so there's, right, like everything, all the protections, all of it falls down. And so they're trying to figure out, becomes competition over resources, over power, over all of it. So they're no longer amassing like they were in the empire stage. Now they're trying to protect. One thing they do is there's a group of, of people, I think, in, in France who they were probably trying to combat a heresy. Right, where someone over there probably started preaching that like the Holy Spirit was um, less than, right? And like questions about the Trinity, because like no one understands it, whatever. And so, um, and this is, um, it becomes pretty popular. And so they take the Nicene Creed, which everyone had agreed on. Actually, the Nicene Creed that everyone agreed on, or even the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed that everyone agreed on, that still isn't what we say on Sunday mornings. Shocker, right? Like, basically, all of church history can be summed up by the Nicene Creed, right? Because when we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, I forget whatever, that proceeds from the Father and the Son, and the Son isn't in there. We say it, right? A lot of people say it, but that clause is called the filioque, right, and the son, right? And so these people in France, sorry, they weren't debating the, the supremacy of the, the Holy Spirit. They were debating the supremacy of Jesus, right? Like this is where does Jesus rank in the hierarchy? Because if the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, what does that mean about Jesus? And so these folks, they're probably trying, in good faith, they're probably trying to say Jesus is part of the Godhead, whatever. And so they kind of kindly add in the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, right? Be that actually changes things, right? Like the Father is like the source of everything because like Jesus actually proceeds from the Father. He's begotten, right? Can something begotten also be part of another begotten, right? This is something that really makes your head hurt. But the other problem, like the theology is not the the theology is important. Kind of the bigger thing that really ticked everyone off is that there was a group over there that just snapped and did it. They didn't say, we all need to get back together and debate this. They were all over here. Bob's over there in the corner telling all his little Bob buddies, like, we're going to start saying, and the son. And so then it gets around, and they're like, yeah, we're a, we're a conciliar church. Right? That means we make decisions in community. We make decisions in council, which we are. We have council. Um, they're not doing that. And so that becomes a real problem with the Eastern Church because it was mainly folks from the West, right? 
the people that are still clinging to the Roman power that do that. The folks in the east, Constantinople, Istanbul, they're like, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. So then we get a showdown in Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom in Istanbul. It's a beautiful place. I should have brought a picture. There's a whole story about that that we'll get to in a minute. And um, there's a, I forget their names, but it's in the middle of a Eucharist service, right? And so one of the eastern, I think it's the eastern um, patriarch who's set up in Constantinople. He's there celebrating. This Roman guy comes in and basically set, they're arguing this whole time. He basically says, you're excommunicated. And the guy like stops everything and says, no, you're excommunicated. <laughs> Right, and it's like a whole showdown, right? And that's where the church splits, called the Great Schism. Right, 1054, that's when the, the Eastern Orthodox Church, as we would call it, Greek Orthodox, all of this, that's where it started. My brother-in-law is an Orthodox priest. Um, and so the Catholic Church, that's where, if you see timelines, I may have one on here, you'll see timelines of denominationalism. There's one big line for 1,000 years, and then there's two lines for three, 400 years and then it branches off forever. There's always that one big line, right, because the Orthodox Church is gonna say we're one continuous line. That doesn't talk about why there's the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia. That doesn't talk about why there's the Greek Orthodox Church, right, like they got their own issues. Um, we're the Episcopal Church, we can't really throw stones at people who have issues. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, well, Peter, but he wanted to call himself the Pope, and there were successive people after that. The Pope start to get power kind of in the Middle Ages. Um, yeah. I think it comes from Father, Pop, like Papal, when you hear that. I think that's true. And I'm saying it out loud, so that's going to make it true. <laughs> Um, You're very convincing, yeah, so there you go. And then in 800, right, like we're trying to figure out how to wrestle with power. This is when the first emperor is dubbed by a pope as the Holy Roman Emperor. And so this is, you know, remember before we had the state putting authority on the church. Now we have the other way around, and the church is granting divinity to the state, right? This leads to a whole bunch of problems that we'll get into in a minute. And so this guy's name was um, Char oh, that's Charlemagne. Yeah. So Charlemagne um, was the, the first Holy Roman Emperor. Right. But then, right, the Holy Roman Empire doesn't really start until Otto later on. And so it takes a little while to develop. But all of that where you hear about the Holy Roman Empire all of that starts in this period here. Because again, we're losing power and control. We're trying to figure out how to hold on to it. And like, basically everything happens because of either money, power, or control. Is like a clean line like Rome and Istanbul? No. I mean, no. I like guess it's never a clean line. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So it became very quickly. And there were folks that, you know, I mean, Istanbul itself sits on two continents, right? It's on both Europe and Asia. And so it's a, it's a weird position. But yeah, it became pretty clear early on the folks that have more allegiance here versus the folks who have allegiance there. And then it develops from there. If, if and when we have a new prayer book, I think it'll be taken out of ours. Yeah, we've agreed. Because, right, I know. I know. If you look at, we have some liturgical resources. You remember that big stack of things that I brought in last week? In there, there's creeds that don't have it in there. And you'll go some places and they'll say it without. If I had my druthers, we wouldn't say it. Not as a theological thing, but like this, like we're going to follow the rules of how things were established. We're going to stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters around the world that do it a different way. Oh, it was all a controversy over heresy. People were probably saying, like, Jesus was just a guy or whatever. And, and they were like, no, like, he's uber important, right? He's equal with God. But then what does that say about the Holy Spirit, right? Because if Jesus and God are so important and they do this thing with the Holy Spirit, then you've got a whole thing about that. And that's why people just need to, like, 
just let the Trinity be weird. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, we're not going to figure it out. Moving on. <laughs> the Godhead is more important. All of it. I can't tell you how that is. Then we get the High Middle Ages. This is scholasticism. This is crusades, right? Now we have the Holy Roman Empire. Now we have, like, a cause to go after, like, make Rome great again kind of deal, right? Like, I mean, that's what it is. This is an operation. Like, we're being sacked by um, Istanbul. I mean, we're being sacked by Islam. Right, and so we're going to turn around and go take it to these people. Also, it's a church growth strategy, right? Like back here, church growth was like at the tip of a spear, which like I'm all for that. Right? I'm going to go out on 1709 and be like, stop cars and be like. Yeah. You know. So all of this is happening in here. Um, and so this is where it, this right here is why people can't be Christian today. Like the source of it is all here. Like arguing over random theology stuff like that. This is where we, like, start killing our enemies. It's like if you go back to the very first church history when Jesus said, love your enemy, good luck with all the rest of it, right? Like, we started to focus on all the rest of it and forgot that bit because, like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the crusaders were protecting trade routes, right? Like, talk about using the church for things, right? Like, you know, like, modern banking was set up because the crusade oh my god walker you sneeze so loud bless you right like they had to protect trade routes between all these places and so the crusaders had to figure out how to get money from everywhere and how to calculate it so like modern banking goes to here right so like you know i joke that like the enlightenment is the downfall of everything we could also go to like the crusades is literally all of it this is where um empire starts to, to rear its ugly head again. The papacy becomes the papacy. As in, papal infallibility comes up here, right? All of this stuff, which is why it'll lead to reformation in a minute because the papacy starts to get all this power. Um, Fourth Lateran Council. Um, this is where like the seven sacraments become, this is it, right? This is where um, yeah, this is the time period where the Pope becomes not just a bishop among bishops, which is how we view either the presiding bishop or the Archbishop of Canterbury as kind of a senior bishop. This is where the Pope becomes kind of basically the one that says, this is what you're going to do, and this is what you're not going to do. And I actually have an army to enforce what's going to happen. Right. That all happens in here. Yeah, they're, they, they got all the money again because empires come back, right. right? And they go take the money by force, right? They figure out that, you know, these silk traders and wherever and all these other people, like, it'd be really good if you were Christian. And also, we're going to compel you, right? It's stewardship season, right? <laughs> and so I've got some crusaders lined up outside the church, and um, you're not leaving the church until you give us your money, right? That kind of stuff, right? What else develops in this time? JB, man, your best friend, he died, and he kind of led a questionable life. And so, like, for 50 bucks, indulgences. For 50 bucks, man, you give that guy a fast pass. Right? And so, like, literally, Disney prints money because we're going to give you this thing that gets you to the head of the line. They learned it from the Pope, right? Like... That, it's all there. And so they can basically print money because they can say, oh, you're going to go to hell or you're going to be stuck in purgatory unless you write some checks. And you think about the Middle Ages, right? They're coming out superstition, right? Like all of the stuff that we hear historically from that time period, it all comes about here. Um, how are we doing on time? We got 15 minutes. We're good. So late Middle Ages, Renaissance, nationalism. Um, Constantinople. And so this is, we're coming out of it. There's more money circulating, and so we can have patrons for the arts. And so that's when, like, all the art you think about, all the cathedrals, they're all in this time because, like, 
one sign of force is to like build the biggest and most beautiful building and it like hovers over people, right? Part of it's the glory to God, but part of it's also, it's really intimidating to walk into a, a place and, and be in the midst of like the biggest building you've ever seen in your life. Um, and to have it be the thing that, right? It's what we do with skyscrapers, right? Like, I mean, there's a reason cities want to build taller and t- taller skyscrapers is so that they can have a point of pride, right? Like when the Twin Towers fell, we're going to build back bigger, right? Because we're going to say, you're not going to do this to us. So churches are kind of, we're going to build big, partly for, for good reasons, right? Like glory to God stuff, but partly also as a, a show of force. There's also nationalism comes in. Like it's no longer just like the tribalism, but now nation states are growing up in this time period. They're being formed. That leads to a lot of why the, the Reformation was so tricky is because its geographic bounds become a lot more important in this time frame. Um, what else is in here? Um, so the Great Western Schism. This is, maybe you've heard a time when there were like two popes at the same time, three popes at the same time, right? Because nationalism that we talked about, every church is trying to set up their thing and there's questions about like the authority of, of the home office. And so we're gonna have a Pope here. And then these other people are gonna have a Pope. And it's like all, this all like the time period of the Hundred Years War, right? If you think about your history, like this is where we're fighting over national boundaries. This is where we're fighting over all of that. Um, and part of that is you get a Pope and you get a Pope and you get a Pope. It's, you know, we're trying to figure that out. Um, Yeah, yeah, kind of, like we need our own thing and we actually don't trust the authority of this place and so, you know, there's competing kings, right? Like, there's a bunch of kings at this time period that that are figuring it out and like, if you have a king, you need a pope. And so all that happens there. And then we get to um, conquest and reformation. Um, So... 1453, the start of this, 1454, that's when um, Constantinople fell, right? Hagia Sophia, right? This beautiful building. It's my favorite place in the entire world. Um, You stand in there, and it's a mosque now. When I was there, it was still a museum, and that was seven years ago. It's since, it was a mosque for hundreds of years after this. They took it by force. and now it's a mosque again because Turkey's going through some authoritarian stuff, whatever. It's a tricky thing. But you go in there, and there's some of the most beautiful mosaics, like images of Christ. I should have brought the pictures. You've seen them. Like, they're chipped off, like, because um, they went in there, and the Muslims thought that if Jesus is God, we can't put a face on God. And so that's one of the things. And so they chip off the faces of these things. And so you go kind of all over. When I was in Istanbul, we went, and we obviously look like Americans. And so the first night we're there, we go into a church, and, and I mean into a mosque, and there's a, an imam there who, like after the thing, comes and talks to us, and very gracious, very hospitable. He wants to show us around. Super nice guy. And he goes into all these places, and he's like, look, this used to be a church. And he points up, and we can see like where they desecrated images of Christ. Right? And so this guy... He's just, right? Like, what if I took him to a mosque? I was like, that's where we blew a hole in the door. Right? Like, it's a similar, he's trying to be very gracious. And, you know, 700 years later, like, you know, we've, I've worked through this issues. <laughs> and so I can be in that place. But, like, it still exists. Like, there's the places there that, like, they took it by force. We did the same thing, and we sacked all of it and burned it all to the ground. And, No. God. They just wanted to get rid of yeah. Or yeah, and they left part of it there as a show of force. Okay. So they didn't want to completely plaster over it because they wanted anyone who walks in there to see, we did it before, we'll do it again. Yeah, because just talking about it, it hurts. Yeah. And so there's, um, not in Hagia Sophia, but in another church when I was in Nicaea, we were in a church 
in a, in a mosque that used to be a church, and they were showing us the baptistry, right, like which used to be behind, and we're trying to leave to whatever. They put up a thing, and there's a security guard there who makes us stop, and so we have to sit in like this baptistry for an hour because they're doing Muslim prayers, right? Which we were there first, right? Like <laughs> literally, and fi- right, like so. Like these issues now, it's comical and we can laugh about it, but like here, um, which led to some of this, or the period before. Constantinople fell and like all of it and a heartbeat was gone. Who are the Jews in all this? Because you talk a lot about Islam and Christianity and like Jews were silenced as well? Yeah, I mean they weren't yeah, they didn't have weapons, right? Like yeah. they didn't have crusaders or they didn't have the I forget the Yeah, nothing had changed for them. They were kind of a small and they mostly it's centered around the Holy Land still. There's a lot going on there, right? There's been war in the Holy Land. We're not even touching that. Like that, like the wars in the Holy Land have been going on forever. And we could teach a whole class on just how those three faced there have fought forever. This is all the stuff outside of it. And so the, um, the Jewish folks mainly centered around there. There's just not enough of them to, to so impact. Well, this, at this point, um, like the fall of Constantinople, that's the Orthodox Church. But it's also, right, like this is a show of force by this thing out there. And so that's happening parallel to, uh, so in the East, they're fighting the Muslims. In the West, they're fighting greed and papal supremacy, basically. And then it all kind of falls apart. And so then we get like the 15th century, the Reformation starts, and this is where someone like Luther reads the Bible and realizes you people are crazy. And so we're going to do a couple things. Well, we're going to do 95 things, and I'm going to slam them on the door, right? The 95 theses. And in there, it's, you know, all sorts of stuff. He really um, ticks off the Pope, and um, there's some back and forth. Luther had a good buddy who, like Johannes Gutenberg, who could, like, print things right? And so they were able to like circulate. And so things could go viral, right? Like they could get these ideas into people's hands um, pretty quickly. Things like the Bible in their language that they could read, right? Luther translated the scriptures. The idea of grace alone, not the 50 bucks JB's going to pay me for his friends, right? Um, Luther wanted to reform the church. I think he would be displeased that he created a whole new thing, right? That wasn't his intention. Um, but even here, it's, it's nationalism, right? So Luther, like the Germans, they're the Lutherans, right? And then you've got like Calvin and, you know, these folks who become like Presbyterians. Because, and it's a national thing. We got our own because we have this king, right, who needs an heir, right? So now we're getting to really how our church formed. We had a king who needed a son, and his current wife couldn't give him one. He was Catholic, and so he couldn't get another wife to give him a son. And so then he's like, hey, Archbishop of Canterbury, how can we work around this? And the Archbishop of Canterbury, who had been reading and seeing what Luther was doing and reforming the church, took this as an opportunity to be like, oh, here I've got a patron who might actually fund this whole thing to like, set the church right. And so it's a marriage um, of, of someone who needed something from the church and a church who needed an opportunity to try to reform. So that is how we came about. So you hear the jokes like the Episcopal Church started over a divorce. It's partly true, right? Um, that discounts the role that like Cranmer and, and those folks had. Um, but that's the English Reformation. Right? There's the Lutheran, there's the Continental Reformations, which is like the, the main countries there, Scotland, you know, all of that stuff. Um, Did a period describe the first war that were kicked off by like, emperors or kings? No. Have we started a new phase outside of the corruption? Uh, no. I mean, we're humans, right? Like, either we had to figure something out, um, and so... I mean, maybe like the, the fall of the empire, 
right? Like that wasn't necessarily caused by corruption, but that was caused by like the failure of the state. And so people run off and set up monasteries. Like, you know, the, the early Middle Ages, right? Like there's a ton of stuff there. It was kind of, there's a book, who wrote it? It's called How the Irish Saved Civilization. And it's this idea that like these folks, like when the world was crumbling, when Rome was in upheaval, these folks like ran to the Irish countryside and like, we're gonna preserve it. We're literally gonna save books, but we're also gonna keep talking about ideas so that when like the dust settles, we can do that. And so that's a period there. Everything else, yeah. Um, it's basically caused by corruption. So here, Elizabethan settlement, I think I mentioned that before. Remember the first couple of, of kings and queens, right? Like um, King Henry was Protestant or he needed a divorce, one of the two. But then his um, Queen Mary was Catholic, and so the church swung from a Protestant side to a Catholic side, back to a Protestant side. It kept swinging back and forth. And then Queen Elizabeth was like, we're going to stop this. And so the Elizabethan settlement set us up as we are going to be an Anglo-Catholic church. We're going to be Anglican and Protestant. We're going to be Catholic and universal. We're going to figure out how to be both things at the same time. Like adults can hold two competing thoughts in their head. Right? All of that. We're not going to kill each other over things. It's called the via media. This idea that we can be Protestant and believe grace alone and the authority of scripture. We can believe those Protestant things. We can also be Catholic and the priest can wear dresses and we can have candles and smoke and, and all of that. So it, it kind of held those two things intact. Um, which is kind of why we become a safe haven for, for Catholics who have had a, a rough time, because it's really familiar, right? You walk into our service and it looks similar. Almost verbatim, yeah. what y'all say. Yeah, right. Whereas like if you go to other churches, it's, it's not gonna be that way. Old yeah. Um, and so that, you know, 17th, 18th centuries, we gotta race through these because we're running out of time. Nothing really big happens here. Uh, revolution, right? This is where like all the countries are like, we're gonna throw off our rulers and so, we obviously care about the American Revolution. This happens in here. Revival happens around here, right? You got all these bored people on the countryside with nothing to do except try not to die of dysentery. They're like, we're going to start, you know, having revivals and all that. And then part of that, the Puritans spring up, right? And it becomes a whole deal. Our problems today are the fault of these people, right? Like, basically, um, kind of fundamentalist, um, you know, that, those kind of ideas that, that we somewhat struggle with can trace back to the Puritans. Sinners in the hands of the angry God, Jonathan Edwards, right? He was a barn, burning, barn storming preacher back then who would go around, and it's this idea that, like, it sparked this revival because you're going to these people and saying, like, life sucks and you're going to die, except Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And for people, like, life sucks and they're going to die, right? And so they need to grasp onto something. 17th, 18th century America was a really hard place. Right. And so they're latching on to this. There's the spirit of revival. Um, so that came up in that time. 19th century, this is another age of empire, right? This is when all of Africa is divided up by the powers and it's colonized, which is why some African countries are um, Presbyterian, some are Anglican, some are whatever, because literally people got together and said, you take that country, you take that country. And that, like, like, the apostles went to Africa, people, right? Like, there's Christians in Africa since, like, any of this crap existed. But, you know, we're the white people. We have the answers. I mean, that's literally what it is, colonialism, right? It's not just political. It's also happening here. Marxism is rising up. Modernism is rising up. This is when a lot of things, right, like the 19th century, like these ideas that, like, has led to our downfall, John Nelson Darby, he is kind of the, the creator of um, dispensationalism, like end times theology, like there's going to be half of us in this room that get like sucked up someday. That is from like the mid-1800s. Like this idea, like left behind, all of that is relatively recent. And so people think like, oh, this is getting back. It's that guy's fault. 20th century, we're living this. Evangelicalism springs up, Pentecostalism. It's another type of um, revival, and a lot of it is battling against postmodernism, where like we we have science, so we don't need faith. We have um, shucking authority, things like that. Billy Graham's first crusade, right? That's kind of a, a turning point in all of this. That 
the rise of, of the evangelicals, the rise of the Christian right, all these things that kind of define the 20th century. And then here's 325, you were asking about that. Here's like all the different where the churches were set up and you can see centers of dioceses, borders under. So even in 325, it was messed up. Um, I'll have these printed up. Here's early church history. You can see just how you know, crazy this is with all these different things going on. Here's the timeline, right? Like the one holy Catholic apostolic church. My brother-in-law is Orthodox. Orthodox think really highly of themselves. So it goes all the way. No, but like they say one holy Catholic. And then at this split, the Eastern Orthodox Church, of course, they're the ones that continue that line. And then the Catholic Church, sorry, Daryl, I love you. Um, and it all spits up here. Here's missionary work where it started. And like missionary work here, you know, right? In 364, there were Christians in Germany, right? It didn't take like settlers to bring Christianity to Germany a thousand years later or any of that. Asia Minor's covered all of it. Um, it gets through all of that. And we're done in 45 minutes, 47 minutes. Any questions? I'll have those. The Church of England is part of the Anglican Church. The, Ang the Anglican Communion is a worldwide collection of churches. The Church of England, the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church in Canada. Ang Anglican is a term that most other provinces use for the churches that were started by the Church of England. Oh. We don't because we went to war with Anglicans, and so we changed our name. But if you hear Anglican Church of Canada, Anglican whatever, it's all part of the same group. Yeah, They're not completely interchangeable, but they're connected. Yeah. 